I'm Andrew Davis, the Director of Investor Relations at PassiveInvesting.com. I want to welcome you to our Investor Town Hall. And the purpose of today is really just to hear from the leadership of our company about the success that we've had thus far and how we're looking forward as we navigate a changing debt rate market, inflation, recession fears, and all the changes that are going on in our economy and world. And so I actually have and can see your questions and your feedback here. So that was very helpful. Thank you all for letting us know that you couldn't hear us. And so if you have questions related to the content of the webinar, as we're speaking, I'll be checking this periodically and integrating those uh, into our conversation. Would also like you to uh, like to invite you to book a call with myself or my team if you'd like to speak about anything further. If you have questions about our group, we're gonna share a link to our calendar so you can set up a convenient time that works for you. Just a little bit about me. I've been with PassiveInvesting.com for just shy of two years now. I am uh, run a team, a tremendous team of five, both investor relations and investor services. And before we get started, we'd like to hear a little bit from each one of you, your background, uh, what you do here at the company. And Danny, we'll start with you. Perfect. I am Danny Randazzo. I live about an hour and a half from where we're at today in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, my wife and two children and our golden doodle named George are eagerly awaiting my return to home. So I will be heading back home, driving back um, after we complete the webinar today. So thank you for being with us. In PassInvesting.com, I work and oversee our asset management team, our finance team, as well as our capital markets team. I'm Dan Hanford and live here in Columbia, South Carolina, which is where we're broadcasting from today. And I'm married and have four children, uh, 11, 10, uh, 6, and 5, uh, three girls and a boy. We also have a standard poodle named Bella. And my role here in the company at PassiveInvesting.com is on the investor relations, investor management, uh, overall kind of marketing strategy and uh, also kind of pushing forward some of the, initi the initiatives that we have to continue to grow, uh, to continue to grow the group. My name is Brandon Abbott. Uh, I live also here in Columbia, South Carolina, technically West Columbia, which is just about half a mile down the road in that direction. Uh, so it won't take me long to get home after this, uh, but excited to have you here today. Thank you for taking time out of your day to, to uh, listen to what we have to say about uh, my feelings in the market. Uh, my role within PassiveLesson.com is overseeing the acquisitions department of all asset classes um, and also CapEx vision and working with asset management as they implement the CapEx vision and handing that process off to them and then interacting with all the departments that were already named uh, today, including working with Andrew and the IR team. So uh, thanks again for being here and we'll get started. Thank you, guys. So obviously, we're going to dig into where we are today, but I think it's really important before we do that to reflect. So over the last four years, and I had to write this down because these are huge numbers, PassiveInvesting.com has gone from zero to $1.3 in assets under management, uh, zero employees, several partners, but zero employees to now 40 plus employees. We've raised over $500 million in investor equity. This month, we're going to pay out over $2.2 million in monthly distributions to our investors. We've got eight full cycle deals with an average annualized return of 28.9, almost 29%. We have over 2,000 investors, about 70% of those are repeat investors. And so my really profound question to each one of you is how? How have you done this? And I'd like to hear from each one of you, you know, why, why you think that you've had the level of success you have? What, what, are, the, what are the key drivers, the contributing factors to going from everything you know, zero to what I just stated? Uh, Brandon, we'll start with you. Well, one of the most obvious things um, that I can point to in, in the success is the, the three people sitting here. Um, less me and more of those two. Um, you know, team is number one. We, we spent the last day and a half speaking about team and how great of a team we have. Um, but that vision of that team and how that was built came from the heads of the people sitting here. And uh when we all talked about what roles we're in, they all were different, but complementary. Um, and that's what is successful in, in this relationship is, you know, Danny has a perspective that differs from mine, um, but he's open to my perspective and, and Dan as well. Um, you know, and Dan is uh, very innovative in his ideas and, and is never afraid to try a new idea. And we've I think we've built a culture of open communication and idea sharing, and there are no dumb ideas. 
um, unless you don't share it. Um, that's the source way. So I think well, there's still the, some dumb ideas out there. Sure. But we won't know it's a dumb idea until you say it and then we'll figure out that's a dumb idea. Let's not do it. Cause I've had some really dumb ideas. Um, you can ask Dan. We all have. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I didn't know it was dumb cause in my head it sounded smart. And then once I got it out, but if, if I, if we have a, a community where we're afraid to, to say a dumb idea, cause we'll get mocked, then I'll, you'll never know. But it could have been a really, really good idea. Mm -hmm. But if, if I keep my mouth shut, I won't know. So I think that's a key. Um, and then obviously, um, I'm going to say God has played a very huge role from my perspective in our success. So I give him all the credit for that. But, yeah. hey, I, would, I mean, I would definitely second that. I mean, the team has definitely been what has gotten us to this point. Um, just the three of us couldn't do what we are doing right now. But I will say that the three of us are what got us started. And I think it started, the team started with us. And with us being able to be there from the very beginning and kind of grow and hire on very strategically people that are very high quality that we don't have to babysit and we don't have to monitor all the time. I think it's been, been very, very crucial to our success. And I also think being able to hire great talent and not making them and forcing them to live in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, it's, it's a, it's, it's a not, if it wasn't for COVID, I don't think we would probably be virtual. We'd probably be more in a, you know, high rise downtown building, but our entire team was virtual. So we have people in all the way from California to you know, Illinois, to, to New York city, down to Florida. So we have uh, people all over the country and it does make it a little more challenging to get together uh, as a whole, as an entire team. But we do try to schedule different, you know, uh, team building events, if you will, like we did the last couple of days here uh, with, with some of our team members and, uh, and, and make sure we can be in person as, 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 po as much as possible. Um, but then being able to have the flexibility of hiring, you know, great quality talent and not forcing them to, to live here, but they can live wherever they want to live and, uh, and still perform at a very high level. And I'll just add, you know, the, the business really started um, based on very basic um, principles that are um, values and principles that can be withstand the test of time. And so in one of the first conversations, I was asking Dan and Brandon when we first sat down together uh, about what their 10 year vision is and what their 100 year vision is, because you know, as real estate investors, your, your ideal is to plan for those investments really outliving you and, and performing in perpetuity, um, whether you, you donate them to a charity or you pass it along to the rest of your family. That's really the, the goals of, of why we invest. And that long-term vision is something um, that's just a, a principle of making a sound investment some place that's secure to put your money. It's got an opportunity to make money along the way. And it's got an opportunity for some growth too. And, um, you know, just that capital preservation place and, you know, the great tax advantages that come along with it. So um, I think that's from, you know, the basic principles of investing and how we've been able to grow to, you know, 1.3 billion $500 million in investor money trusted with us, um, sound investments that produce monthly cash flow where you can distribute out over $2 million to investors on a consistent basis. Um, those, those founding principles are really what guide us and what will continue to guide us um, as we go through the next year, the next five, the next hundred and the next 500, as I, I plan even further into the future. Um, the, the other piece about just the growth of the company, again, very basic sound principles of the, the business started with the three of us um, and just our kind of blood, sweat, and tears putting everything into it. But we had the basic principle, right? We're not some, some technology company that's spending a boatload of money without any income coming in. So our different backgrounds that brought us together, we all share in that same basic business principle of you generate income, you pay your bills, you save your money, you reinvest it back into the business, you grow it, you generate more income, you pay your bills, you save your money, you reinvest it. And that's what we've done month over month over month over month as we've grown this business. And that basic collect more money than you spend, save it and reinvest it 
is um, a, a principle that we all value first and foremost, and that continues to be just a critical um, alignment of interest that allows us to carry and, and hire on the team as we grow, grow and continue to reinvest that. So um, very basic investment principles, very basic business principles, but these have been tried, true, and tested for many, many decades before us. And uh, we just live by those, you know, guiding principles. And, and one other thing that I'll add into this, this is kind of going from to the IR side of things, the investor relations side is you can have a great team, you can have you know great business practices, but if you don't have very good communication skills with your investors, it's going to be very challenging to be able to grow a business like this. And I think one of the things that we do very well is being very proactive in our communications with investors, making them feel comfortable when there's a Hurricane Ian coming through and, and going to knock over, you know, knock, 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 through, not knock down, but like, you know, go through a couple of our properties. They want to have those updates. So we, you know, even during that time, you know, we made sure we set multiple email updates to set the investors, you know, you know, uh, a mind at ease, if you will. And sharing the bad news if there's bad news, right? You can't you can't hide from the bad news. You got to make sure that you share that, and you know investors appreciate that. I think that's one of the reasons why we have such a high repeat investor rate. So we have it's every every project that we put together, we're usually about seventy two to seventy three percent of those investors that are investing in that project have invested in a prior deal. It's a repeat investor, and that that says a lot when an investor puts money in the first time. But it says even more when they actually put their own put more money of their own money in. And then the next level there is when you start to get a ton of referrals. And we're in that phase now where we do get a lot of referrals. And you think about a referral from you know, a, a local restaurant and you're sending your friend or family, that's, that's one level of trust. But when you tell your family and friends to go wire $100,000 to invest in a project, they, you definitely have to trust that group to make that kind of a referral. Because you know, I think we mentioned this yesterday, that that can be some very hard Thanksgiving meals if you're sitting across the table and you you and you had that uh, family member invest 100k and then all of a sudden it got lost or it was with a bad operator and they can't get the money back or there's a lot of different things that can happen and so I think part of our ability to raise the kind of capital that we've been able to raise and uh, and continue the, the the trajectory of the growth and the path that we're on is because we do have a really good investor relations process in place of making sure we communicate with our investors and we have that full transparency and, uh, and slate and, and ability for them to be able to reach out to any of us and ask questions. We don't try to like, you know, hide behind an ivory towel or tower or anything like that. We want to make sure that our investors realize that we're real people just like them. We have families that we're supporting and we want to grow our wealth as well as our investors' wealth, wealth for many, many decades. Yeah. So you all touched on uh, a couple of really interesting things, but you touched on this, Brandon, and then you said it, Danny, but uh, Ray Dalio, who is arguably the most successful investor, well, one of the most successful investors of our time, he wrote a book called Principles recently that's gotten a lot of traction. And in that, he talks about a meritocracy of ideas. And so for the last couple of days, we've had the leadership team in a room, and it was not a the three of you all sitting up front saying, this is what we're going to do. It was it was really a roundtable discussion and a very robust, respectful discussion where ideas got floated out there, needs were articulated, those got bounced around. And I think there's a lot of value in that. And so being, uh, having worked for you all for the last couple of years, I really value that. I know uh, that all the employees do as well as they feel like they can raise their hand and say, hey, here's an idea or here's some, here's a challenge, whatever it may be. And it really creates a, a true mastermind. Uh, so one of the things that we didn't touch on, but I want to touch on before we jump into this next section where I'm going to grill you guys a little bit All right. is your background and what qualifies you to do what you're doing. And the, part of the reason I asked that is because we're going into rockier times. We've been, we're, we're in rockier times. We've been in since the company started, but also this has become a more crowded space and there's a lot of people uh, asking for money. And so you know, start. We'll start with you, Danny. Tell us a little bit about what you did before and how that's landed you into what you're doing now. Well, I um, I always tell people that you don't you don't get anywhere overnight, and so really, you know, my lessons um, of learning about money uh, and and value of a dollar really came. Uh, when I was growing up, when I was 10 or, you know, eight, 12, whatever, um, 
I was always the entrepreneur in the neighborhood, mowing grasses. Um, my, you know, the value of a dollar was hot summer days in Michigan, moving wheelbarrows full of sand from the front yard to the back beach um, in heavier increments than I personally weighed. So I was probably moving 125 pounds of sand on wet, wobbly earth, trying to keep it upright, not strong enough to really do it, but out there bust my butt to do that. And um, that's where I learned the value of a dollar. Um, you know, was raised by great parents, went to college, got good grades, got a degree in finance, went to work in corporate America and financial consulting, um, loved it, traveled around a bunch, um, not quite the, um, the work-life balance to have a family. I was on the road probably three, four days a week, um, but phenomenal experience. So I helped multi-billion dollar corporations around the world implement new processes, technology, and um, different, whether it was like a people component or a technology component to help them improve their financial operations. So within the consulting world, um, knowing the basics of how to present, how to speak to people, and really diving into financial analytics using Excel, using macros to go through data. Um, and at the same time, while I was working a full-time job. I knew that exchanging that time for money was not a way to uh, grow wealth or have your money work for you. And so I started to invest in real estate I, you know, put my money where my mind was at, uh, purchased a commercial real estate building, started to rent it um, in the office space. And that kind of took off and then bought another one and got another one and did some different real estate deals. So I've had the experience to do all sorts of real estate investments out there and ultimately knew that multifamily investing you know, then getting into self-storage, hotels, car washes, institutional quality assets where you can have professional full-time management was the way to do it because you can control your ROI, but also your return on time. So a lot of folks out there may have a collection of single family rentals. Maybe you've acquired them over the last few years and they take up a lot of your time because you're still managing that manager, but institutional quality assets allow you to scale. And um, ultimately, you know, really got me to where I am today. So the key takeaway, um, consulting work, financial analytics, really being comfortable in Excel and working with the numbers and being able to underwrite deals uh, the experience of first owning a, a wide variety of assets and investments, and then understanding that institutional quality is is really the way to go. Thanks. Mr. Hanford. Yes, thank you. Um, so my background is actually from running multiple seven and eight figure businesses. So one of the largest ones was is actually, I still own it today. My wife and I started it back in 2011. It's a group of non-surgical orthopedic medical clinics. We have four locations, one located here in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, one in Greenville, Charleston, and North Augusta, all of them in South Carolina here, and grew those to a point where we were able to step out of the business full-time and uh, promote the CEO, COO at the time to the CEO. And we still have that kind of monthly management meetings with our corporate team with that group, but our CEO is the one who runs the day-to-day -day operations and you know, my wife and I have our corporate directors meetings with them, uh, with that team on a monthly basis for about two hours, usually once a month, to be able to make sure we're still maintaining our, our, our uh, uh, oversight, if you will, of that group. And so with that, I, I, had, I did a lot of research and a lot of training around uh, business strategy and marketing and, uh, and kind of implementing a lot of strategic objectives. And so that's really kind of where my background comes from, is from the business side of things, and uh, I really enjoy it a lot. I really enjoy being able to find new opportunities and new ways for us to optimize and improve processes and systems, and uh, and also learn trying to trying to learn how to, I, I'm still learning about learning how to manage people and continue to train people and cultivate our our team and allow us to be able to be a great cohesive unit, if you will, that will allow us to be uh, an unstoppable team that will allow us to continue to grow and expand and provide great opportunities for our investors. So, so 
my background um, was mainly in construction um, through my working career. Um, I had a general contracting business, framing business, grading business in Greenville, South Carolina, pre um, the housing crash. So that I think was a key factor in where I am today as far as understanding economic downturns, the effect that they have on what I'm depending on for income, the importance of cash flows, uh, what do people do in a recession or an economic down, downturn um, when it comes to spending, housing, different things like that? What are the patterns? What are the habits? Um, a lot of the asset classes, actually all the asset classes that we're involved in were pinpointed, I think with the exception of the debt um, piece, were pinpointed by myself like during the economic downturn and seeing some of the uh, issues that I was facing um, you know, and, and how you can come back from that. Um, and, you know, the, that builds character, builds um, experience. And the, the key to um, that is building resilience, um, not stability, because everything's always changing. And as long as you understand that it's going to change, it changed, you know, in 2007, I wasn't expecting 2008, uh, you know, and in 2019, I was expecting 2020 and COVID and all the rest of it. So everything's unstable. What you need to be is resilient. Um, and I think that's the biggest piece of that because um, there was a lot of challenges there. Um, coming out of the construction piece, I moved out of the housing market um, into interest adjusting. Um, so there's a lot of dealing with people, um, building relationships, and that aspect also estimating um, was a big factor there. And a lot of that uh, played into our asset management and how we handle insurance claims with uh, Hurricane Ian and different things. Uh, and replacing roofs and hail damage. Uh, that's kind of where I lived for so long. Um, and then working with the asset management team to have a vision for the project and seeing, uh, I do have an eye for seeing a project completed in my brain. And I know what it's gonna look like without ever seeing it on paper. And then seeing that come to fruition and seeing the actual building is exciting for me. And, um, and also I love, uh, pursuing deals. Uh, I don't know where that one came from. Maybe it's just my nature, uh, yeah. but uh, I, I love what I do. Uh, um, so as far as qualifications, that that's basically the background um, that I have. Excellent. Thank you. So we are moving in or we are in a time, right? And I, I any, any person watching this, we all know that right? we are looking at most recent data shows 8.2% overall inflation. Interest rates have gone up over 300 basis points in the last six months. The Fed is, depending on who you listen to, is signaling another 75 to 125 basis point increase by the end of the year. There's doom and gloom in the news. And of course, this, this uh, causes some concern and some reticence. And so if I were a cautious or a skeptical person, I might say, Congratulations on the success to date, but it's been a really great market. So as we're going into uh, the this or we're in this more challenging time, one of the biggest questions that's come up in uh, preparation for this webinar and as I'm, I'm reviewing questions live here as well is interest rates and how interest rates are going to affect our business. And I want to really touch on that from three, uh, three areas from how it's going to affect the capitalization of our deals, specifically with debt, um, strategically, how it's going to impact our business, if it's going to cause any strategic moves in terms of the types of assets that we go after, the market classes, asset, asset classes, et cetera, and then how it's going to affect just our overall pipeline for deals. And so, um, Dan, we'll start with you in terms of some things. Yeah, yeah, I think point when the, it was, as the interest rates have been rising it is it has had a disruption in the deal flow which has also made us go back to the drawing board to figure out why is the why are we not being able to get deals that make sense right and so they're being able to go to the drawing board and say okay what can we do to be able to find you know either find better deals whether it's finding them from you know, being more direct to, to seller uh, or maybe it's finding deals where the seller doesn't have such unrealistic expectations of the of the purchase price or the sale price. And there are uh, return levels that we're looking for as well. And so that's really where you know the deal flow really gets shot is when we find we don't we can't find deals that really pencil to the point where our our and we know our investors will invest in because there's certain levels of returns that are we know that our investors are expecting. 
And if we can't provide those returns, then it's a challenge to be able to raise the funds to be able to close a project like that. So for us, it's been, you know, from a, from a strategy perspective is, is, is adding on some additional asset classes like we have with the Express Car Wash brand that we started acquiring earlier this year. And that is definitely something that our investors have enjoyed being able to invest in, uh, being able to have the higher preferred returns, the potential for the, for the higher overall returns. And, uh, and so, it, especially because we're balancing those returns with what we've seen over the last several years when the economy has been doing really well and the returns that we have been able to provide to our investors. I think you mentioned it was you know, almost 30% uh, annualized return or IRR, I can't remember which metric it was. Yeah, but being able to provide those returns is, is great. Um, but we, we can't find deals to the, and pencil them to the point where we're gonna continually get 30% returns. Now, I will tell you that from a strategy perspective, we wanna find deals that could consistently provide 20% plus in returns. Now, that doesn't mean we underwrite for 20%. You know, we're gonna underwrite more conservatively than that. It's gonna be lower than that. We're probably, from a multifamily perspective, seeing return levels going down to you know, 10, 11, 12% on the low end. And then, of course, you know, as, as we're underwriting and expanding our cap rates uh, upon exit, or excuse me, compressing the cap rates upon exit, it is showing us that we can find some you know, higher level returns on, on the top end. You know, maybe, maybe, we were, maybe last year this time we we're, we were showing 18, 19, 20%. And then now we're going to start showing on the top end, you know, for multifamily and even on the self-storage front, you know, you know 14, 15, 16 on, on the high end. That doesn't mean that we, we don't think it's going to do better than that, but we would rather present to our investors a more conservative project and under promise and over deliver. But our, our team and our goal is always to provide you know, assets that can be invested in that can provide a 20% plus return, whether it's presented on a piece of paper or not that way. That's, that's what our goal is, is to be able to provide those higher level returns. And I think being able to move into a different asset class like car wash has allowed us to continue to stay uh, in front of our investors with great projects that are, are solid assets that are providing great cash flows. And uh, we're, we're working on, on a couple other asset classes as well uh, to be announced into the future. But there are a couple other asset classes that we are working on. Uh, one that is a, a, a kind of new idea, new development. No one's really done it yet. Uh, and then there's also other asset classes that we're looking, on, we're looking at as well that I think will allow us to continue to provide solid returns to our investors, no matter what type of an economy that we're in. But from a multifamily self-storage and a hotel perspective, I do think that the, the rising of the interest rates has affected purchase prices, which has affected the number of deals going to market and has also been a resetting of expectations of sellers. And I, when, we, when, we, when we say resetting of expectations, I think it's more of a our resetting the expectation that, that the seller is not really a seller or not. Because even, even our group, we, we, we actually put, I think, three or four projects this year on the table to sell and went out and market it and just couldn't get the, the strike price that we wanted. The assets are great, they're cash flowing well, they're very well occupied and they're, they're, they're nice assets, there's no problem with them. But we want, if we can't hit a certain level of return that we projected, then we're just, we're just gonna, we'll hold on to it and wait for another two or three years uh, until the full completed business cycle is done. So you kind of look at us and go, oh, they had unrealistic expectations to sell. And, you know, we, we really didn't because we, we knew that we were only a seller at one level, whether it's going to be now or two or three years down the road. If we can get it now, great, we'll sell. But if not, then we'll just hold on to it. So I think there was a lot of those transactions that were trying to be done this year that just were not being completed because of the rise of the interest rates and the lower valuations that just weren't hitting the strike prices for us for certain groups and certain organizations. Excellent. And then, uh, Danny, I'm going to kick it to you because so many of the questions we've gotten have been around interest rates, interest rate volatility, and a lot of the deals we put together over the last couple of years, we utilized uh, bridge debt or, or floating rate debt. And uh, at the time, you know, interest rates were in the low to mid threes. You got excellent terms, but of course, the risk being that when interest rates rise, the, the debt service on those assets is going to rise. So can you speak to how we're positioned on those assets today, and and uh, you know what you see, um, do you see kind of any um, you know more volatility in terms of how we're positioned on those assets where we do have floating rate debt? The the floating rate debt assets um, we we look at and evaluate on a very regular basis as to the performance of where we are at currently. Um, what the option could be if we wanted or needed to sell and compared to 
where we are at with a potential refi into a fixed rate loan. The nice thing about our portfolio is our bridge loans are typically three, one, one. So three years and then a one-year extension and another one-year extension. So that gives you five years of runway. Um, All of our deals that we've done, we've acquired rate caps. And just the, the basic fundamentals of a rate cap is if you close a loan, a floating rate loan at 3%, um, and you buy a 2% rate cap, your all-in rate that you would pay is 5%. So where we are at today, all of those deals are capped out to the maximum uh, interest rate that we can pay. So even if rates triple tomorrow, we're still going to be paying that in that example, 5% all in. So that gives me the comfort level to know um, exactly what our income and expenses and our debt service payments are in a month. And it allows us to make decisions with time on our side, right? We have at least another year, two or three with our existing loans in place. And so you know, again, over the next 12 months, really every month, we look at where we're at, again, from a existing position versus a sell position versus a refi position. Probably what will happen over the next uh, four quarters, kind of getting into the end of 2023, there'll probably be advantageous opportunities to refi some of these deals and hold on to them. And so, you know, basically with the refi strategy, we would be refinancing the existing debt we have in place and ideally getting a a fixed rate loan at, you know, the the fair market interest rate um, at that current time. Rates are really volatile, right? The uh, seven year and 10 year US Treasury numbers are a lot of how fixed rate loans are um, kind of pegged off of. And in the past, those rates may have moved, you know, a few basis points in a day. Um, over the last kind of couple of months, we've seen at times those rates moving 20, 10 to 20 basis points, which is really. Um, unseen in the last many, many years. And so with those rates being volatile, today you could refi. um, Tomorrow you might be up 20 basis points. The next day you might be down 20 basis points. But again, the nice thing is we have time on our side um, where real estate, you don't have to make a decision in 24 hours. We can make those strategic decisions and can evaluate them um, every single month. So Um, am I perfectly comfortable with all of the floating rate loans we have out there? Absolutely not. Are we doing everything in our power to evaluate and make sure that number one, we're protecting our capital and looking at the best way to preserve and maximize investor returns? Yes. I feel very confident that we'll be able to um, weather any storms again, we're we're capped out. So the interest rates that we spent money on are now paying off in our favor with these rising rates. Um, from a just a high level interest rate perspective, you know, the messaging is um, depending on what financial information you read out there. Through the end of the year, there might be another rate increase or two. Um, things ideally will kind of level off or plateau out into Q1 of next year, maybe Q2. And then in Q3 and Q4, we might see some reductions. So um, I recently wrote an article in um, one of our investor newsletters that went into a little bit more on interest rates and um, just what has historically happened over the last 50 years with rates. So check that out or follow up with our team and we'll get access to you for that. Um, so that's kind of the existing portfolio. Um, again, time is on our side, but we're certainly very active every single day in um, 
hedging our risk and making sure that we have multiple strategies in place to, again, sell, refi, hold, extend loans and having that one, two, and three-year option. Um, I feel really good about that with the historical, you know, recession times where it might be 12, 18 months, um, kind of 24 months at the very latest. What do rising interest rates mean for new acquisitions was another question in here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for the deals that we're evaluating now going forward, it's really fixed rate debt, which makes the most sense. We are, we are founded on those basic principles of investing of a, a secure investment to protect your money and have money um, ideally made month over month. With that, with floating rates uh, being so dramatic increases and decreases, depending on what day you're getting a quote, uh, those just don't make sense. With a fixed rate option, we are able to fix our debt for five, seven, 10 years typically. And it gives us a great opportunity to look at the business plan for the next five, seven, or 10 years and not have to worry about ups and downs in U.S. Treasury, what the stock market is doing. And so anytime that we can take um, and minimize risks or exposures is a great way to ensure we have a sound investment. And so having those fixed rate interest rates for our deals is excellent. What that means is we're going to be having lower LTVs, maybe in that 50 to 60% um, loan to value range. And so we're getting less debt. What does that mean? We're bringing more equity to the table, um, which typically in those scenarios, that volume of equity increasing means returns are going to come down slightly. So we're very much in line with kind of what you were saying, Dan, about the the vision of asset classes and where returns are. But we have a very sound investment um, when you can collect income, pay your expenses, including debt service, and have a, a very low break-even percentage. So we're still doing deals where we can see 55 to 60% break-even occupancy on a multifamily deal um, which to me, again, if we can take interest rate exposure off the table with a fixed rate loan, we have less debt, we have more equity, we have consistent cash flow from that model, it's still a sound investment. It's still a sound place to put your money, safely secure, have cash flow along the way, and have some upside into the future. It's just we need to be conservative in those projections, which, you know, to Dan's point is where you're going to see those low to mid teen return projections. But guess what? If we come out of this and interest rates, you know, plummet back to that three, four percent range, then we're going to be in a really, really good position to exit those deals at compressed cap rates compared to where we buy them for today. Um, which those numbers might not even be on the table that investors are used to seeing. And so you could easily exceed that 20% kind of goal for an investment, but we're just not going to underwrite that because that's never the message you've heard from us. Um, going back to day one, when we launched the first deal, it's always been conservative. It's always been risk averse. It's always been a safe place to put your money. Capital preservation is absolutely number one. Making money along the way is number two. And if we can get some upside, which historically we've always been able to do, we have a win. But the founding principles are not going to be deviated from because that's not what we believe in. And that's not what we're trying to do with multifamily investing, with storage investing, hotel or car washes? Two things I'll add to that. Um, one is around the, we are very comfortable with those assets that have the floating rate debt, like Danny mentioned. And one of the reasons is because from the very beginning, we've always tried to make sure we were very well capitalized on all of our projects. 
So we have plenty of operating reserves on all of our assets right now. And if we need to dip into those, we can. We're not in the risk of any type of capital calls or anything like that. And so I think our plan from the very beginning to make sure we did overraise additional funds for those extra operating reserves has been very beneficial to mitigate a lot of that risk, especially that we're seeing right now. And so I think that's something that has been very helpful to, of course, put our mind at ease because we know we have that, uh, that, that those operating re- reserves that are sitting there that we can tap into if we need to, right? And then the second thing I was going to mention is about, um, um, there's an article I wrote probably been about a year ago called The Five Red Flags for Real Estate Investing, for Passive Real Estate Investing. And right now, I've had, there's been a couple of iterations to it, and there's seven of them on there. If you're interested in that article, I would suggest you go to our website, passiveinvesting.com slash red flags. Um, no spaces, just, just red flags after that. And you can, you can review that article. And but one thing that we're going to be doing is adding another one to that article. So it'll actually be eight red flags. And that eighth red flag is actually making sure that any operator that you invest with, with any type of floating rate debt, that they actually are purchasing a rate cap, like Danny mentioned. Um, I was talking to an investor about two weeks ago, and she had invested in a project and they did not, the operator did not buy floating rate debt. And now they're in a situation where they're going to probably have to either sell that asset at a lower valuation that they expected. They're probably not going to lose money, but instead of making the 20% plus that they were expecting, they might only make three to 5% or 7% or whatever it might be. And so uh, for me and my wife and our portfolio, on that's kind of how we develop that uh, those red flags list. That's going to be another one that we're going to add to it. But I would encourage you to go to our website and get that article and review it. And even if you're an operator watching us, trying to like you know, figure out what we're doing, it's, it's, it's a great article for you to review as well, because you can kind of see some of the things that other investors are, are looking for and are, and are expecting. And I think it can help you in a way to be able to set up your own processes uh, in a way that can be very successful for you. So this is such a great conversation because one of the things that we hear a lot right now and, and kind of a, a buzzword in the space is conservative, right? Conservative, conservative. So you've touched on how we're conservative with our floating rate deals, how we're conservatively underwriting deals now with fixed rate debt at very low LTVs. Dan, you've talked about how we're conservative in terms of you know over-raising, being well-capitalized. Brandon, I'd like for you to speak a little bit about how our underwriting has shifted to be more conservative in terms of what we're looking at for forward-looking rent increase projections and how we've tweaked our underwriting model to factor in the changing acquisitions, you know, pipeline environment and what we're anticipating over the next three, five, seven years. Yeah, there's there's so much to touch on there uh, as far as what we have adapted to uh, thus far. One thing that I want to point out, kind of playing off of what you said first before I get to that, yeah. is the Protection in a time of crisis is is created before the crisis occurs. And so picking uh, quality assets and quality markets with quality debt and quality operating reserves and and sufficient with quality residents is why um, these assets and these investments are sound through an economic downturn. Because if you've listened or followed us, we always talk about recession-resistant asset classes. You know, and, and somebody would say, oh, what about car wash? Well, the price point, we looked at that. Well, the price point is so low, it's not something that people cut out. Or um, the fundamentals of, of this downturn, what does it consist of? Um, you know, in 2008, it was a housing crisis. Then we, had, um, then we had an employment crisis coming through COVID. So we were checking, doing demographic studies and making sure that we had the right residents in our properties that would be able to afford um, the rents and, and focusing on that. This is a um, an inflation problem, um, so we have to watch out for. Um, so to tie back in, is watch out for our rent increases because the the purpose of these um, rate increases is to curb inflation. So that means that the rent growth that we've seen um, over the last year that was not expected. So we had a little, yeah, I mean they're way higher than what we thought. So we were doing great. So we took those great times. Um, and, and we prospered, and now you just have to tighten up and say, okay, maybe we can't push it $300 per month, maybe it's $150. Um, and really working closer with, um, in our markets, uh, and, and our property management team and our asset management team to make sure everybody 
is in agreement. And we've implemented processes this year to make sure that every department is touching that deal and understands their role in the deal and making sure it's it's approved at every level. Um, you know, whether that's an investor sentiment or uh, capital markets, um, you know, what market it's in, is that is that a good market? So we're all collaborating, even with third parties, our third party management company, to make sure that um, we don't have any blind spots when it comes to um, the current market. Um, as far as um, conservativeness in the underwriting, I would say that we have increased our expansion uh, sensitivities on a lot of things, uh, whether that be rate or cap rate expansion on sale, because um, we always expect the cap rate to be worse or we want to project that to be worse than when we buy it. Um, and someone may argue, okay, well, if we're going to see reductions in Q3, Q4 of next year, possibly, then why are you underwriting an expansion? Um, because we want to be conservative. Because uh, we don't know that it's going to and uh, that it's going to come back down. Plan for the worst right. and undercommit over best. deliver yeah. is always our model. And you know, we also understand that we were projecting um, expansions, and those expansions have been exceeded by the current market. Cap rates have grown further than we thought they would. Uh, but the great thing about all of this is the cash flowing asset aspect. So capital preservation, and you're still making money and still getting those monthly checks, regardless. We may not be able to exit the asset right now because of the current market, and we and maybe the pipeline will slow down, but the money you have invested is secure because of the quality of the asset and the quality of the underwriting that occurred prior to the economic downturn. Now, as far as solving problems of pipeline, um, we have been... Um, fortunate to be in a great market where deals were just coming in, we were growing exponentially. Um, that's no longer the case. Um, what, you know, cap rate, or interest rates have gone up. Cap rate is typically, it's always tied to interest rates and it's always, I would say, 100 to 150 basis um, above the interest rate, roughly. Um, and But they always lag each other. So um, we saw rent increases and we saw rate reduction last year. Um, and there was a period of time where we could buy properties really easily and make a lot of money. Good, good, good deals, good projects. Um, but then uh, sellers or owners realized that they could get more and rent was going up. So the NRI was going up. So the prices were going up. And so they could exit deals faster than what they had projected. So it's a five-year deal. Now they can exit in one year. Um, and that's great. Um, that caused a pricing spike. Um, and now the expectations of the owners and sellers have to readjust now as the interest rate went up, cap rates going up, prices are coming down. Everybody was super excited and some greedy about what they could get for their properties and assets. And now they have to come to the realization that maybe they'll have to hold that for a little bit longer um, and uh, or they'll just get less for it. Um, and once that those expectations match up with the market, it'll take about a quarter or two quarters. Um, then the deal flow will increase because expectations will be reset. Um, there was uh, another a point on that that I was going to make, but I lost it. But um, that's basically what we're doing from um, uh, an underwriting perspective. Pipeline, we have to shake the bushes a little bit more. Um, that was the other point. There are people that are not as good. There are groups and operators that are not as good at underwriting conservatively that maybe didn't buy a rate cap and maybe didn't uh, have as much operating reserves. And there are, I, there may be opportunities for distressed uh, purchases or people that couldn't, can't refi and their loans coming up now. And so those are opportunities we can capitalize on um, in those times. So just because the downturn doesn't mean it's a negative, uh, you know, the, the famous quote, you know, the best time to buy is when there's blood on the streets. Um, you know, that is a true statement. Um, you see that money can be made in any environment and it's the resilient team that's able to do so because they can shift really quickly, be agile. And I think that is speaks back to what we talked about, about building the culture here of uh, a very agile team that can pivot on a dime. Okay. And the debt change. Okay. It was private bridge, uh, life code. Now it's agency. And, and that's, we've seen that switch cyclically, cyclically, <laughs> if I can talk within a year, uh, usually, you know, about a half a year, it'll be um, agency and half a year, it'll be bridge or private or, or life co. And that's just a, a reflection of what the market's doing. So 
Um, we're constantly keeping our finger on the pulse of um, the pipeline, um, adding um, strategies to drum up deals and that's in relationships um, and, and also, you know, good old fashioned hard work uh, getting in the car and, and uh, having meetings uh, with people, meeting owners, going to conferences and, uh, you know, can't coast through hard times. Uh, this is when the work um, has to go in to find more and more great assets. There's plenty out there for everybody. Um, there, I mean, as I sit here doing this interview, I can, there's a, we have kind of a panoramic view out here. I can see uh, four um, brand new multifamily assets being built within my eyesight in, in north, south, east, west uh, direction. So growth is still happening. Uh, it's a blip, uh, which will get past. And, and another thing too, I think <clears throat> to note is you know, we, there's there's so much talk about uh, the negatives of rising rising interest rates. I did a webinar last week, and one of the things that I pointed out is that they're affecting everybody, and they're also affecting single family home buyers. So the same single family home buyer that was looking to buy a five hundred thousand dollar home six months ago, now they're looking in the low three hundred thousand dollar price range. The median home price in the USA is in the about four hundred twenty five four hundred thirty thousand, depending on on the most recent numbers. So those are people that are not going back to live in their parents' basements. They need somewhere to live. Um, not saying they currently live in their parents' basements. These are not, <laughs> you get my point. They need somewhere to live. They're going to have to rent. And so not only inflation was a driver of rents, but it's also just demand as well, which is why you see so much multifamily construction. And so when we look at our rent increase projections, they're usually three to 4%, which is just the historical average. We're not, we're not doing any great speculating about looking back over the last couple of years and using that as a basis for what's going to happen. So that's another thing that I've appreciated about how we, how we're looking at deals currently. So one thing I want to say, we've gotten so many good live questions here. If we don't address them here, my team and I will uh, go through this list and we will respond to you directly, your question directly via email by the end of this week. So if we don't hit it here, I'm not ignoring your question. We would just be here all night. We're having a great, <laughs> we're having a great conversation, but we respect your time. We've all got to get home to our families. And so we'll, we'll, we'll have a hard stop here at 430, but if we don't hit your question, we'll definitely email you with an answer. Uh, one of the questions that we get is as we've grown and as we've diversified into different asset classes is uh, with always a little bit of trepidation, right? You're growing really fast, and how are you? How are you managing all these different business units? So, can you speak a little bit? And this is open ended. Talk a little bit about who uh, who is who's running the ship day to day at these at these different assets and then these different asset classes, and then on our side of things about our asset management team. And I'll leave I'll leave that open. Yeah, it. I mean, it's pretty simple. Of um, a, as you grow. Yeah you need to grow the team with it. So the, the basic principle, right? Passiveinvesting.com as it collects income and pays expenses, including salaries. Hopefully every month we save a little bit of money that we can then reinvest in the company the next month. And uh, having that same mindset between the three of us and just that entrepreneur and business experience has allowed us to be a very well-oiled business operation. Um, as you look at the income and expenses and the amount saved and reinvested in the company, that guiding principle I spoke about very first is what has allowed us to grow very simply. Um, having the capital to invest in the business, hire the, the experts. So within the multifamily asset management side of things, we have a phenomenal asset manager on our team. Uh, Brian's background, uh, he was just saying it today, it's the smallest portfolio he's ever had to manage. Only 1.3 billion, only you know, 30, 40 properties across everything. And his background, experience, expertise, um, it's the reason he was one of our first hires and uh, why it was so important to, again, take care of the portfolio that we have, invest that money in hiring Brian um, as one of the first employees to make sure that the portfolio is sound and protected. And then that freed us up to continue to go look for the second deal, the third deal, the fourth deal. Um, so Brian helps us out over the Multifamily side, we have a phenomenal relationship with our management company, FCA, 
as we've grown in portfolio size, they have strategically grown and hired right alongside us. Um, FCA management also manages for one of the largest state pension funds in the United States. Um, They are an absolute professional manager. They are an institutional quality management company. One of the reasons we work with them. So um, we're not their only client and customer and they, the, the owners of FCA are um, very like-minded business owners, operators, experienced professionals. So very grateful to have them on the team with us. Storage side, Brian helps us with the asset management. We've got two great storage partners, uh, John and Chris, who really help run and oversee the day-to-day. So as we went out and acquired the first storage property, John and Chris were there to help support and oversee that entire team and getting them off the ground. So again, a strategic decision to bring them on as storage partners and run the day to day. Again, it's a it's a business operating perspective. You know, hire people, income, expenses, save your money, reinvest it. Um, great management team there. Um, we really outgrew the previous manager that we've had and we found a excellent replacement. So very comfortable, confident in that third party management's uh, ability to operate. The alignment of interest is excellent for them to keep our facilities occupied, pushing rents, stabilizing some of the lease up deals that we have. And again, John and Chris are able to oversee the day to day along with Brian Um, with his detailed reporting and tracking. Um, We track income on a daily perspective. We we track average rent growth on a weekly perspective. We have a KPI template that every management company at every property provides to us on a weekly basis. Occupancy, average occupied rent, um, any sort of delinquency, the critical KPIs that allow us to be extremely effective to catch issues before your 30 or 60 days into the future and you're trying to look back at the data. So um, that's our approach on the multifamily side, on the storage side, you know, as we've grown into the hotel space, again, one hotel asset at the moment, Brian can easily handle this. Again, it's the smallest portfolio he's ever had to work on. Um, Great management company there. Um, Dan and Brandon have known the owner and manager um, for that third-party management company uh, for a long time. This wasn't just something that we kind of fell into last week or a couple months ago when we acquired it. It's been um, an investment of time and research and learning over the last few years to really just acquire one. So, um, you know, syndication, investing in real estate is not something um, that you can just jump into overnight. It's something that you have to spend time and energy into. Um, Car wash side, again, similar concept. A lot of studying information. Um, You acquire your first site, you learn a lot, and you continue to grow that team. So we've got an excellent team of people to um, look for deals, underwrite deals, do our asset management and um, really effectively manage the car wash side of operations with our own third-party management company and uh, a phenomenal team of professionals there. Thank you. So I think that's a really good segue because we've, I think we've had a really good conversation about multifamily and how we're looking at that space. A lot of questions about car washes. It's a new asset class for us. And inquiring minds want to know, right? Uh, We required our first two sites in March. I was actually on site washing cars. And now we're selling selling memberships, selling memberships, pulling weeds, you name it, (laughs) getting getting down and dirty. And now we're up to uh, 17 with two development sites. So talk to me a little bit. And Brandon, I'll start with you because you're on the front lines on the, the deal flow, the acquisition side. Talk to me a little bit about um, how, you know, the, what, what we've seen in these first, uh, what is it, eight, seven months of being, being in the car wash business? And, and specifically, the questions are, hey, what's, 
you know, expectations versus reality. Uh, what have we, what have we learned, and then kind of where are we going from here? Yeah, um, I think this ties back into the the former question: Who's watching the ship? And, and I would honestly say everyone um, is, and especially at the top level um, in different aspects. We're all keeping an eye on it, getting the reports, um, and the growing so fast. A lot of times you're seeing um, fruits of previous labor. You know, you see a car wash pop up, but what you may not have seen is the work that and the study and the research that went in before that occurred. Like the hotel, uh, Danny mentioned, we had those conversations uh, two, three years prior to that first one and we're still- kind of paused it with COVID. Yeah, it was yeah. before COVID happened and then it was so like, ah, uh, table. It's not like we're, you know, sitting there and ding, oh, we're going to buy car watches. You know, there, there was a lot of work and effort that went into that decision. And that, that conversation started four years ago. Um, actually, just over there at the airport, um, we started having that conversation about car washers. It was an industry that, so we're growing fast because we have a great team and we're implementing ideas that we already know are sound. Um, it's not just random ideas. Yeah. Uh, but as far as the car wash is concerned specifically, and, and Dan can pick back off of this because he he's works very closely with implementing new processes and marketing, which is really key there. It's a more of a retail business. Um, coming into it, it's just like anything else. You don't know what you don't know. Uh, you can read all the books you want. There are no real books on running a car wash. So that's difficult. There are plenty of multifamily syndication books, which uh, many of you have read. We've all read. Um, and that doesn't mean you know how to syndicate multifamily. That means you know a little bit. Uh, but until you actually dive in um, and, and do the work, um, that's really where you learn. And um, we have such a great team. <laughs> on the underwriting side, um, on the management side, that we have learned more than a lot of the industry professionals that have been in this industry for 20 plus years. We've exceeded uh, their knowledge base. There, there have been um, third party groups that um, we came alongside trying to get knowledge and just went right by them. Uh, we, our growth and knowledge um, intake has been such um, that we've exceeded um, past uh, some people's growth expectations in that area. Um, one thing that we've learned is, um, you know, everybody wants to paint a, a great picture. If, you, if let's say you want to get a multifamily syndication, if somebody's writing a book about multifamily syndication, they're going to present the best picture because they want you to buy their book. And, and a lot of that, you have to be cognizant of that. If it's uh, whatever car wash manufacturer company it is, they're putting out numbers and they want you, they're, they're, they're giving you the best worldview but not the rea realistic worldview. So, you know, what is your capture rate? How many cars do you need to pass by the car wash per day? Um, and what's the industry standard capture rate from that? They'll tell you a number. That number is not accurate. Um, and now we have real-time numbers. We were within the range, so, and we are always conservative. So we have reserves to overcome some of those discrepancies because we are intelligent enough to know that we don't know it all. And our underwriting reflects that. And that's why we have operating reserves. That's why we, we have sensitivities in our debt range. That's why we have sensitivities in our capture rate. Yeah, that's great if you think you can capture one and a half percent of the 20,000 cars passing by per day, but is that realistic? I hope so, but let's not underwrite for that. Let's go here. Um, and, and then we'll test that model. And if it is closer to one and a half percent, then let's underwrite one percent. Um, and, and that we feel comfortable there. So really... I feel we're in so much of a better position because I feel our underwriting is, is really good. It's a fine-tuned machine that will continue to need uh, fine-tuning as we are um, learning to be resilient in that field. Um, I think the biggest piece was how to underwrite the membership piece um, as opposed to the single transaction piece and how does that income work and how do they work together to get to our total annual income. I think that was a formula that took a lot of time uh, yeah. to try to sort that out. Um, but I think we have a, a great grasp on that um, and continue to, to learn in every area. But Dan has uh, more insight on the day-to-day -day just... Two quick things that I'll add. Um, just from, from things that we've learned through the, the short-term experience of now owning and operating these for about <clears throat> seven or so months now, um, that again, all three of us, the entire team, no one 
by any means thinks of themselves or knows everything. Um, we are all constantly learning. Is my mic still good? We are all constantly learning. And so we, we love to look at the numbers and the data to see where we can improve from uh, two things. Number one, uh, humans are very uncomfortable with change at times. So what we've learned and what we've adjusted for future deals is we know some of the existing members will quit the membership just because it's sold and it's under new ownership. We actually learned this from a local Columbia location because these two knew one of the members who quit and they were like, why did you quit? And they were saying they just love, love the brand of the old place. And you guys put a new brand and you painted it. And I didn't like that. And so we've adjusted our underwriting to account for, you know, a month or two of people who are going to quit. But at the same time, we can sell a lot more memberships with a new paint job and some nicer signage and some brighter lights. So one thing, the second really quick thing, um, looking at one specific location in Colombia, we identified that the capture rate was abnormally low, right? What terrible job are we doing at this location? Why is it so different? Uh, it, and it took going and seeing the property and understanding that most of the car count was coming from whatever it was, the south to the north. And on that side of the road, there was a massive foliage of trees on an adjacent property owner's lot. And so it was find that owner, let's pay him to cut these trees down that are all overgrown and nasty looking. And now our capture rate, looking at things on a daily and a weekly basis is so much better because of that small change. So we're constantly evaluating and looking at things to see where we can improve. And again, just the, the fundamental principle of always be a learner. I would say that the, from an operations perspective, the, 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 the greatest challenge with the express car washes is the fact that there is no easy push button for property management like we have with uh, multifamily or self storage or even hotels. And so one of the reasons why it took us so long to get that in place is because we had to develop our own car wash management company from the, from the ground up and, and forcefully uh, vertically integrate to be able to manage the assets on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a daily basis. And so being able to start the management company to be able to manage these assets, we don't currently do any third party. Right now there's no plans to be able to do that. It's gonna be primarily managing our own assets. And, uh, and mainly because we have some pretty aggressive growth plans that you know between now and the next year, we wanna acquire another hundred locations. So that's a very large increase from going from you know 19 locations that we have right now to getting to the point where we have a hundred locations. And then, uh, and so being able to have uh, our property management company in place and having uh, Cameron, who's the one who's, who's heading that department up um, is, is one of the managing partners over on the management side of management company side of things has been very, very crucial to the success of car washes. And again, it goes back to what we said from the very beginning. One of the very first things we talked about is having a great team and being able to have a great team in place from the management side of things, I think is, uh, definitely the, the one of the keys that has allowed us to be able to continue to have success. And, you know, I, I know, you know, we talk about, you know, just painting the building and, uh, you know, improving a few little, little things from, a, from a, a, a cosmetic perspective, but it's really around technology, I think is the biggest um, play that we have with car wash, because right now we're, we've already um, hired on a developer and they've developed us an app for our car washes. Feel free to uh, go to the app store if you want, download it and then check it out. Uh, it's the, the name of the brand is Hurricane Express Wash. If you open up your phone and you just type in Hurricane Express Wash, you'll see the blue and white logo there. Um, so if you wanted to check and kind of see that out, but that app has allowed us to really capture a lot of data around our around our customers. Because when we first acquired the first two locations, one of the biggest things we saw was that we have no customer data. Uh, I say none, but we had one thing. It was a credit card number, and that was it. <laughs> Um, but no in fact, name, no, no name, address. There's, there was no contact information if they had a credit card that expired. You know, um, what do you do? Well, you just wait for them to hopefully show back up at the car wash and tell them they can't get their car wash until they update the credit card. Where now we've implemented software that has allowed us to be able to streamline the process at the, at the car wash for them to be able to pay their, for their car washes. 
They can upgrade and downgrade their memberships within the car washes. We now have an ability to get name, phone number, email, address, and there's a virtual garage where they can add their car to the garage so that now we have data around what kind of cars are being washed at our locations. And we're in talks with some strategic partners to be able to create some sponsorship revenue within the app with like maybe some local car dealerships or oil change providers or body shops. And so there's ways for us to be able to create some additional uh, revenue that we're not even accounting for. We're not even underwriting for that uh, with this type of a software that has uh, allowed us to increase the number of members. We were just talking to, to Cameron this past, uh, actually just yesterday, and he was saying that you know since September 29th, which we're sitting here right now is October 17th or so, and we've had over 500 new members sign up through our app as a member, um, and it's because of the technology that we're putting into place. And so uh, the technology from the consumer-facing side of things has been very, very crucial, and then also the software development side of things from the operations side of things. So we're working on both of those fronts, which is really, really neat to see. And it's going to be a, a lot of work. It's been a lot of processing uh, and a lot of uh, 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 data di- data diving or uh, data, re- data data analysis, if you will, to figure out what's what's the best type of software that these operators need. Because with car wash, it's a very fractionalized it's a very fractionalized space, uh, meaning that there's not a lot of institutional players in, in there. Uh, in, in this space, there are a lot coming to the space, but there's not a lot here just yet. And I think over the next probably seven to 10 to maybe 15 years, we're going to continue to see a huge runway for this and a lot more private equity coming into the space, primarily because they like the business model of low labor, low overhead, and high cash flows with monthly recurring revenue that can that can be implemented. You can implement things right away and be able to increase the uh, the operational efficiencies of the businesses, but also be able to manage the, cu- the customer very well at the same time. So, a hundred locations in the next in the next twelve months is the goal. And so, talk a little bit about why the big goal for acquiring the number of sites, and then what our overall exit strategy is for the car wash business. Yeah. So uh, there's kind of I guess three ultimate plays with the car wash space. Uh, there's the play of a traditional real estate play, like you see with multifamily and self storage or whatever, where we buy an asset, we hold on to it for three to five years, and we can turn around and sell that one asset for a profit, right? And that's not our ultimate goal. That's kind of like a backup plan. If the first two don't work, but the the primary two two primary plays is to grow the portfolio to be very attractive to a very high quality group of institutional buyers. And uh, so our, our, our goal is to get to 300 locations over the next five years and to be able to do one of two things, either sell to one of these large private equity groups, or we have the potential because the revenues will be way over $100 million a year, we'll have the potential to do our own IPO at the same time and, and have an even higher uh, return. And so a lot of these assets that we're buying right now are, you know, seven, eight on the low end, upwards to maybe like you know, 11, 12, 13, 13 uh, times or 13x on the EBITDA, which is similar to the NOI. I don't want to get into that discussion just now, but um, when there's been several transactions over the last couple of years in the large private equity space that has provided uh, well over 20x on the EBITDA, uh, 23, 24, 25 um, X on the EBITDA. And so the, the the more locations you have, the more attractive you are to these larger equity, private equity groups that do have deep pockets to be able to acquire a large portfolio and be able to grow their brand and have that ability to continue to grow it even more for them to do their own IPO if they want to, if we are, if we aren't going that route, or for them to be adding to their own portfolio that's already publicly traded. There are a couple of publicly traded car wash brands out there. Um, one primarily, but then there's other ones that have other service type businesses that have car wash into in it as well. Uh, but the goal is to be able to be very attractive to private equity um, or a potential IPO down the road. That's fantastic. And I think one of the things too, is we talk about obviously having an offensive strategy with growing that business and, and really growing, growing a, 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 a nationally recognized brand too. But as we scale and one of the things, so Cameron, the guy that runs our, our managing partner, director of car wash operations, he's one of the sharpest people I've ever met. And one of the things that that scale allows us to do is as we grow and as we cast that vision for our suppliers, it's actually reduce our expenses as well. So we can go in and renegotiate chemical contracts and uh, 
submit materials and preventative maintenance contracts and things so we can lower our expenses. So it's not only about growing revenue, but it's also about optimizing expenses. As yeah. Well. As we, you know, volume discounts is huge yep. in the industry and, you know, we can certainly identify vendors to give us better pricing for the yep. current high volumes, but even higher discounts, because if we stick with them for a while, we'll have a lot more volume. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, so somebody somebody asked, can you go through and answer all the questions? This is a really great conversation and so glad you're enjoying it. But if we did that, it would be longer than the extended cut of Lord of the Rings. So we're not going to do that. <laughs> uh, but I will answer, my team and I will answer all your questions. And one of the things that we're going to do as well is we're going to send up a uh, send out a follow-up with the replay. We're also going to send a short survey. We want to know if this is valuable to you. We want to know what future content you'd like to hear from us, just informational, just me sitting down with these guys and hearing their perspective and talking about different things. So please share your feedback, uh, good, bad, or indifferent with us because we want to continue to provide really valuable content to you. Uh, I want to shift into really with the about uh, about 15 minutes we have left, two things. One, uh, our real estate debt fund. There's been a lot of questions around that. So I've got some specific questions for you all there. And then kind of, uh, you know, looking forward, there's been some specific questions about our forward outlook over the next five to 10 years. And then in the in the near term, kind of greatest opportunities, greatest risks or threats. So we'll start with the real estate debt fund. So as we've seen interest rate increases, one of the consistent questions we've gotten from investors and, and even ahead of this town hall is, are you going to increase returns to investors as uh, you see a shift in the debt market? So I'll, I'll, I'll leave that open, but what's our plan, if any, for adjusting that return and, and just a little uh, color on that. Yeah, so I, I would say that we've definitely had some discussions around that internally. Um, with the current fund that we have right now, um, there, there is no plan to be able to increase that with that fund. We have had some discussions internally about releasing a different fund that can provide some different uh, you know, uh, liquidity options, uh, lockup periods, and, uh, and dollar amounts for investments and increasing the return from there. So there, there are some discussions internally about that, and uh, hopefully we can you know, finalize some of those things and get them out. But um, uh, what we have to, we kind of have to realize with the, the debt fund is that it, the, the risk goes up right now as, as, as we're going into this market where valuations on single family residences are going down. It, it causes a little bit of riskiness and volatility, if you will, in the ability to properly vet these types of borrowers that we're lending the money to. And so our real estate debt fund is primarily lending out to hard money lenders, not hard money lenders, but hard money borrowers, where they're buying a single family house, spending some money on renovations and turn around and flipping it and selling it. So these, these rehabbers are, are fix and flippers. And we have a very strong, what we call like our VIP borrower base, if you will, uh, where we have a great pool of, of, of borrowers that have performed on multiple acquisitions and multiple um, full cycle projects that that we, we, what we want to work with. And we don't, with our debt fund, work with any new operators. So they have to have a track record and experience of already performing on these types of assets before we do it. Um, but with that said, the interest rates haven't really like, it's not like all of a sudden we went from like 12 to 16% because the interest rates you know, on the lower end went from three to you know, seven and a half to eight that we're seeing right now. Um, it doesn't actually work that way on the, on the hard money side. There is a cap or a limit to kind of what you can offer there. And so we, in order to stay competitive, we still have to have a, a very uh, uh, similar interest rate, if you will, as we've had in the past. And so um, uh, we, we do realize that there are, are people out there that want to have an opportunity to invest in, a, in our debt fund and have a higher return. They're willing to put in more money. They're willing to lock up their money more than 90 days. And so we are working on that. So we, were, we should have something out in probably the next, I'd probably say the next 30 to 45 days, we should have something out to be able to present to, to, to our investors to kind of share with them what that opportunity is. But for those of you who don't know about the debt fund, feel free to reach out to, to in, in, the investor relations team. And, uh, and even if you go to our website, passiveinvesting.com under offerings, it'll actually give you the opportunity there to find more information about the real estate debt fund. But it basically offers you the opportunity to be able to put your money into this debt fund, minimum investment is 25,000. You earn a 6% preferred return. 100% of the cash flows goes to investors on this debt fund until you reach that 6%. You wanna pull that money out, that 6% on a monthly basis, you can, or you can compound that on a monthly basis to kind of increase your return uh, month over month. But you have the ability to get that money out 
um, with a 90 day option. So basically you can have the money in there for a month, uh, a year, 10 years, and you give us the notice whenever you want that capital back as well as your return. And within 90 days, uh, we do our best to, to get that out. Um, and so that's, that's the real estate debt fund. And I think that as we move forward into the future, there are some opportunities for us to be able to uh, um, add on some additional debt options, maybe even a, a different uh, type of debt option where it's not just inside of these hard money loans, but maybe some other types of, of assets or different types of maybe some business transactions that could occur that could allow us to have some great solid returns for investors. So um, as those come about, we'll, we'll definitely present those to our investors and try to stay on the on the cutting edge, if you will, on those types of offerings. Yeah, two, maybe three things. Let me see how quick I can get through them. <laughs> um, number one, you said about being competitive with rates. Um, you know, our competition is not your local community bank on the corner that might be offering seven or eight percent today or five percent, whatever it is. Um, it's other hard money lenders. There's a couple of institutional players in the space that lend out over a billion dollars a year. So this year we're going to lend out over a hundred million. Um, they're doing a billion a year, and their rates are still in that you know ten to fourteen percent range. So we are still in the sweet spot um, for for loans and rates um, compared to the competition. So it's not quite the same as uh, the Fed doing a 300 basis increase, like Dan said, we're just not going from 12 to 15. We would lose way too many um, customers. So we're still in that 12 to 13% range. Uh, The other thing, just with the economy in general, a couple of things that we've done, um, we've brought on more team members to the rehab wallet team to um, number one, ensure our compliance and our portfolio is in great shape. So Um, you know, Hurricane Ian was coming, it was projected to hit the Florida and the Southeast US predominantly where a lot of the loans are. And so one of the things the team kind of scrambled to do a few days before the hurricane was coming is call and verify all of the insurance um, was in place and active and up to date and paid for, right? Because as the first position lien holder, we are the largest named insured on that policy um, that the borrower pays for. So that's a critical task. One of the new things the team has started to implement is, um, you know, not only getting a um, broker opinion of value or an appraisal on a property, but also physically at times driving to these properties to go and verify the asset, getting a second opinion. So there's a lot of steps that the team has taken as the economy has changed, as interest rates have gone up to go above and beyond um, to really ensure that the portfolio is very well protected and positioned um, to, to continue to perform with its uh, 0% default rate. Yeah, which is, which is an extraordinary statistic. And so some of the questions we've gotten here is, you know, do you think defaults will rise and i think the i think yes uh, you know zero a zero percent default rate on a hundred million dollars in loans this year and, and 50 last year yes at some point there will probably there will probably be some defaults but i think one of the reasons that that i'm personally invested and i think a lot of people are is that that delta or what warren buffett would call the margin of safety right between the return that we're paying out and where we're lending the capital out as well as all the defensive measures we have in place in the portfolio. And we were uh, in this meeting that we're in, this is, I think this is really timely. The entire rehab wallet team was here. And if you're not, if you don't know what that is, it's just the borrower facing side of the real estate debt fund. So it's who's actually originating, underwriting, servicing uh, these loans. And it's, it's a highly um, competent, capable team. Um, and I think the, I think what we walked away from is it's like the, 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 the most buttoned up in terms of data team. I mean, they've just, they're tracking their numbers on like an hour to hour basis. And so um, I feel extremely confident in that team. And I would say to our investors, you can as well. Yeah. A couple quick points yeah. um, from a, a loan to value perspective across the debt fund portfolio, we're at about a 67% loan to value. So what that means if, if, real estate prices plummet and they drop by 20% and folks are selling at 80% of value, guess what? Our 60% um, LTV, our 67% loan, very well protected to get that paid back. So if we do have a default, we can fire sale the property, um, 
Our managing partner, Kelly Garrett, has 30 plus years. I think she's flipped over 120, 150 houses herself personally. Um, so if we need to, we can get it done. Uh, third option, we have this great pool of VIP borrowers who are uh, very, very loyal to working with us that we could fire sale the property to them. They could finish the rehab. They could get it sold. Um, so I feel very good about if there is a default, right? Chances are, um, you know, you, you could only go up from zero, but I feel very good about the, again, exit strategies, the opportunities to overcome a default. We've got a lot of options and ultimately a 67% portfolio loan to value um, makes me feel very good when I think about, you know, housing prices when there was a housing crash in 08. And right now it's more of a economic interest rate kind of global uh, recession challenging time. And housing prices, again, in the Southeast where predominantly the portfolio is at should remain fairly consistent. So feel good there. Great. So um, again, this has been a tremendous conversation. Um, in order to respect everybody's time, we're gonna uh, we're gonna conclude it. But as we conclude, I want to go to each one of you, and we talk a lot about about risks and how we're hedging and downside. So I want to know a what's your what's your biggest concern? Say over the next twelve months, but then uh, you know, as importantly, uh, what are they? What there's lots of uh, great expressions, and I can't the quote doesn't quite come to mind. But anytime there's a crisis or you know, that presents an opportunity. So for each of you, as we're going into this time period, because we, again, we spent the last couple of days together and the, the sentiment in the room was not fearful. Uh, it was it was confident um, in, in our strategy, in our team and where we're positioned as a company. And so, you know, what do you see as the biggest opportunities for how our company is positioned and how we can come out of this economic season even stronger than we are now? So Brandon, I'll start with you. Yeah, um... I think the, the beautiful part about um, undesired slowdowns uh, is what I'll you know say this is, um, is we can work on infrastructure. Uh, when you're growing really fast, which has been pointed out, um, you know, it's a little more fast paced and we're getting it done and we're doing it well, but really shoring up the foundations when we have a little bit of slowdown. Okay, let's, let's take this moment now and let's work on this foundation. Let's be, let's come out of this even stronger. So I think that's that's one uh, key takeaway or one opportunity in a downturn. And also just understanding that we have prepared for these moments in time. Like, okay, will uh, defaults go up in rehab wallet uh, or in the pick fund? Maybe I'm going to say yes. Okay, we've prepared for that, and so we're not going to freak out when it happens. Okay, you know there. That's why we've put safety measures into place. Same thing with recessions. You know, we have put safety measures into place. Um, so it's, it's yeah, we don't want it, but we're not, that's not unexpected. We, we understood that we've had those conversations ahead of time and prepared accordingly. And also um, just, I think, um, I know that we are stronger today than we were when we started this company four years ago. Uh, I can't even quantify that. I still remember driving around with my tools in the back of the car, going to apartments and, you know, actually working, you know, like doing the actual physical uh, construction work to where we are now. Um, we've grown so much um, and this is only an opportunity to grow even further. And this is also where it's going to separate. Um, this is going to really make us stand out as one of the superior operators in the real estate investment world. Uh, Cause there are a lot of choices out there and a lot of operators and a lot of other companies that are, are trying to do the exact same thing. Number one, they don't have the team that we have. Um, I know that for a fact, so they can't be as good as us in that aspect. Um, and I don't care who it is. So they're great companies. They don't have our team, um, but it's going to separate those uh, ones that did not um, underwrite conservatively, as I mentioned before. And that's going to be an area of opportunity that it's going to lessen the competition in that sense. Um, deal flow will increase after that occurs. Um, and then once, uh, you know, sentiment is, is uh, bettered, and it's more confident, um, you know, the pricing will adjust and everything will be as it should be. Um, but I also like um, change like this keeps you on your toes. Um, it, you don't want stable, you want resilient. 
Um, cause every, people get bored with stable. Um, you know, I do, I, I like change. I have to move. You've probably seen me fidgeting in this chair cause I don't sit still very long. So I can't go hunting or anything like that. I can't sit still that long. Um, so changes like this present, um, challenges and, uh, all of us like to problem solve. And so it's just a problem that we're solving for. Um, so, yeah. I would say that, uh, kind of piggybacking on what Brandon said is one of the, and something that I said earlier on is about our assets are very well capitalized. And so instead of being an operator that has to kind of, you know, freak out when this kind of economy comes about, we're, we're, we're well positioned. We've been planning for this for, for many years and it's now here, right? And we don't have to sit there and freak out. We can sit there and now focus on operations and systems and processes. And, you know, one of our out of our out of our meeting the last two days, one of the biggest themes that have come out about it that has come out about a a weakness of ours, which allows us to start to work on it, is IT, is, is software, is technology, and now being able to kind of take some time and focus it on, hey, how can we improve our operational efficiency by implementing and developing our own proprietary software, whether it be for car wash or for our self storage brand or even for our entire kind of a uh, private equity group to be able to create a software that can make a very cohesive uh, uh, a system to put very cohesive systems in place. Having times like this allows us to be able to focus on that and will allow us to come out on the other end of it, still very well capitalized with now some better processes and, and, and systems that allow us to continue to grow even, even, even further and, uh, and, and not become what I've called before a donor syndicator group or a donor private equity group that basically is a, is, a, is a private equity group that tried to do it, they didn't succeed, and all their investors now come over to us. I would look at it from kind of the, the next year, tw you know, 12, 18 months. Um, I, I feel we're in a very good position to, you know, number one, protect the existing portfolio. Um, number two, there's still sound deals to acquire and close on with the, the fundamental principles that we use for investing, a secure place, conservative investment, make some money along the way, have some upside in the future, have some tax advantages. Um, we can achieve those goals with additional acquisitions. Um, I think as an investor, personally, in every deal that we put out there, um, you need to have your money working for you. And I am not a big fan of the stock market, right? Everybody currently logs into their, um, you know, 401k or stock account and sees a bunch of red on the screen, right? It makes you feel a little pit in your stomach, um, but you have no control over that. I think investing in real estate, is um, one of the, the tried and true investment classes um, that you can control. You're not uh, beholden to the Wall Street people or some stock price dropping because of uh, a supply chain issue in Asia or a boat dam being closed. Mm -hmm. Elon Musk tweet or, or, or a tweet, <laughs> right? I mean, that's crazy. So that's why um, investing in real estate for me is just a sound place to do it. It's a little bit more slow moving, right? But it's why we like it. It's secure. It's slow moving. Um, a tweet is not going to drop the value of the asset and we can choose when we sell. Um, so protecting it, there's still going to be opportunities to acquire. Um, five years into the future, you know, we've got these new initiatives, um, the car wash opportunity, uh, adding additional storage facilities, um, having that same sort of exit strategy with a storage fund one, storage two, um, adding a storage three to the mix. Um, those collective properties can be worth a lot more as a whole instead of their individual parts. So, um, and that's not how we underwrite them. We underwrite them as a one-off deal, but that opportunity exists for a larger multiple on an exit. So I think that's where you continue to acquire, um, evaluate your hold, sell, refi strategy on a monthly kind of quarterly basis. 
um, evaluate what the economy is doing in general and um, allow these very well located, very well capitalized, um, very well built assets to maintain their occupancy, operate on a regular basis, and uh, progress into the future, continue to grow the team. On, on top of that, you know, with the comparison to the market and real estate investment, if you're invested in stock and there's fear of volatility in the market, which that same sentiment does apply to the stock market at this current time, you know, it's about a tangible asset. Can you drive by and, you know, look at how your Amazon stock is doing? No, you can't. It's, it's a nebulous thing. Can you get Jeff Bezos on the phone and ask him what he's doing about, uh, you know, the current drop or Elon Musk? No. Um, with real estate, you can see the asset. You can see the improvements, how the, 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 the properties have been painted and the landscaping's better. You can get on the phone with us, email us, um, direct access to us to ask us those questions and, and have a town hall where we're expressing, you know, our confidence in, in the days ahead. So I think that's a, it's invaluable. I completely agree. Well, I want to thank each one of you guys for taking the time and just hanging out with us and talking to our investors about what we're doing and where we're going. And again, I want to thank each one of you for attending, for the questions you submitted ahead of time, for the questions you submitted here. I just want to reiterate, if we did not hit them here, my team and I will get you answers by the end of the week. I was a little ambitious with the answer live button, so I know we didn't hit all the questions that I had to answer live on. So I'm aware of that. I promise I will go back through and hit those. We just popped a link into the chat. So you can schedule a call with me personally. I created a, uh, a, a special event uh, for anybody that wants to chat with me just about anything we've discussed here about our outlook, uh, questions, whatever it may be. So I'd be happy to connect with you. And uh, lastly, please, we really want to hear your feedback, uh, what was valuable, what you would like to see for future content. We want to continue uh, to be in front of you and uh, really view you as our partners. And so when we were going around here at the beginning and we're talking about 500 million raised and 1.3 billion in assets under management and, and all the great things we've done, that doesn't happen without you. That doesn't happen without you investing with us over and over again. That doesn't happen without you referring your friends and family and coworkers and pediatricians to us and can't tell you how valuable that is. We, we truly, truly appreciate and with each and every one of you. Um, I would personally like to take each one of you out to dinner, but uh, I would never be home. And so um, all that to say, really value you and your time. And with that, we'll sign off and hope to connect with you soon.